<laughs> oh, <laughs> there we go. Sarah May. Um, is she from Montreal? I believe she is Montreal. Wonderful. So the first video that we played was all shot in Montreal. And if you miss Montreal, <laughs> then you can totally just look at it and go, oh yeah, that's Montreal for sure. Uh, more plateau stuff, right? Like that's where, so, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Wonderful. Anyway. Um, cool. Welcome. Hi. How are you? Um, are you doing okay? We're kind of like in that sort of mid-semester period. You've got your midterm coming up. Um, I hope that you're not too stressed about it. Um, it will be challenging and you will have all of the tools that you will need in order to be able to do your very best. Um, so there's going to be a big chunk of time within which you can start it and then once you decide to start it you will have an even big chunk of time, way more than what you should need in order to be able to complete it. Uh, you can use all of the resources in the world that you would like except for uh, those um, uh, websites that are specifically designed uh, to support academic misconduct. So the one that comes to mind is Chegg. You cannot use Chegg um, <laughs> or any of the others uh, or any of the Facebook groups that exist or whatever. Meanwhile, um, there's what is a, this book face? I'm what is this about? book face? Yeah. Meanwhile, there's a big pool of questions, and so everybody's going to have a different combination. Uh, in different orders and things like this, um, meant to really allow you to focus on your own learning process. So the big thing about the midterm is that we hope that by writing it, you learn more. Yeah. Um, and you learn it before you actually click the answer so that you get things correct. <laughs> um, so anyway, we're, we're going to give it a, a shot. Obviously, we haven't, um, well, we did the final exam um, last semester in this similar type of format. Um, but that was very rushed and we've learned from that. So we're hoping that, um, that everything goes really well, um, for this, for this round. And by rushed, we mean we put it, had to put it together quickly in yeah. a strange format. Not that the students were rushed, just no. like you will. You, they had lots yeah. of time. You will have lots of time. There's some specific questions still about Respondus and Lockdown software and we will not No. No fucking way no <laughs> um and not, not only that but we are actively engaged in conversations uh to support to support student campaigns to get rid of them um and uh, we have already consulted with student groups um in order to help um and we are more than happy to continue to do that um sign the petition sign the campaign support the move to get rid of respondus or proctor you or any of those lockdown uh and recording uh, software. Yep. Uh, other specific questions about is it going to be multiple choice? Yes. Is it going to be some short answer? Yes. There'll be some yeah, like yes, no things. As Dr. Yeah. Jacob said, they'll everybody's what you see is not going to be what your friend sees in the city over. Yeah. They're they're kind of drawing from a pool. Yeah. Um, how do you study for them? Take a look. I mean, so talk to each other. Um, talk to each other. That's where that's a great place to use your book face groups is to talk to each other. Design questions. Uh, try and model your questions on the kinds of questions you've seen in the lectures. All those lectures are, of course, on Course Link. All the lectures are, of course, on the YouTube. Um, and so, so try and model some things. Base them, if you hate mussels, base them on your favorite organism, which I presume is an ant. And, <laughs> and please join the group study session that we've initiated yeah. uh, with help from Anmol. Thank you so much. One of your, your fellow students in 1070 put together a very fun and very cool phylogeny. We've uh, posted... Very tasty. Very tasty, yeah. We've posted the phylogeny in the discussion group under topic one, evolution. Uh, and we've posted the challenge for how we can study together. The more of you who participate in this, uh, we promise you it will be worth 100% of your time to participate um, in, uh, in this because, uh, because of the questions that we're doing for the midterm. So study with us, study together, um, study ethically and collaboratively, and everything is going to be okay. Anything and else? everything's not okay. It's not the end yet. It's not the end yet. Um, uh, is it different for everyone? Yes. yes. I hate those software. So do we. Is it open book? Yes. It's open, yes. Inter open internet. 
uh, open brain. Open brain. Open your brain. Learn stuff. It um, means it means that the questions aren't going to be, you know, what's the definition of genetic drift, right? Because that's, well, first of all, yeah. nah. Um, but it's going to be about bringing things together, looking for examples that you want to use on the internet. The, the questions are meant to, to be written, to take maybe 15, 20 minutes or more to put together an answer, to poke around on the internet. You are expected to use the internet to find things, yep. um, and then to evaluate them, make up your own modifications to make it so that it answers the question or devises the scenario that we want you to do. So we're going to ask you to really like dive in and marinate within all of the different <laughs> concepts. Okay. Um, do not memorize things. You can always Google it. If you don't remember what genetic drift is, yeah, so um, you're answering so lots of those questions popping up about what kind of lessons, what information in the lessons is important for the midterm. Mm -hmm. It's not the memorizing. It's not saying, Oh, what muscle was this? What did, yeah. what did this do? What did that do? We'll give you a scenario. So it's about you putting together, uh, the concepts, and applying them and showing us that you understand them. Maybe it's tree-based thinking, maybe it's this or that or the other thing. It'll be tree-based thinking. Yeah. Is that, that's, yeah. that's not a spoiler alert. Join Remember how much time we spent with tree-based thinking? It's yeah. going to happen. I see one of you say, it says your week doesn't start until 9.30, so you didn't get the quiz in. Just send us an email. We'll work it out yeah. with you. Um, yes, we can extend it, but we need to do it for individuals, uh, you know, based on reasons and things like this. So just get in touch and, and we'll figure it out for you. It's fine. And is it just evolution? It is just yes. evolution. Yeah, just, just, just evolution. Small topic. Yeah, evolution. <laughs> okay. So. I think that's it. Well, it'll have to be it because we can come back to these in the in the afterwards. Yeah. We should, but we should start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, we love you too. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Okay, so let's get started because we are done with evolution and we are moving into ecology, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't have a conversation about how these things are. Yeah, because remember those hierarchical structures that we drew, you're going to see them in a second. When we leave a section, we're not leaving it, we're encasing it in a new section. Yes. Like a tuma. <laughs> like a tuma. It's not a tuma. It's not a tuma. Okay. It's an onion. <laughs> uh, we screenshotted that because that was beautiful. Um, and now, speaking of beautiful, speaking of beautiful, but not only that, <sighs> Smith will cry the second one, right? I, I because, like it. This is, this is facing one direction. Right. Oh, right. This is tree facing West. <laughs> and now this is tree facing East, um, with a little video because the forest moves. Yeah. Yeah. This makes me very happy and sad. This is, um, uh, this is in the rainforest on a volcano that I work at in northwestern Costa Rica, and uh, and I obviously haven't been there since January, and it makes me happy to see it, and sad that I'm not there, and happy that those people that live there are safe and... Yeah, yeah. And I think about our children, actually, when we went there and saw that tree with them. Yeah. And and had a picnic in just the forest, inside, the forest. inside just, right there, just just back there. That's right. And you know what their favorite memory of this whole trip was? <laughs> when we asked them, was they say, "Oh, the peanut butter and banana sandwiches that you made were so good." And it's literally <laughs> true because the bananas in Costa Rica, they are good. They're, they're, they, <laughs> bananas were, as you and all of you know, many of you know, um, if your banana hasn't had a long voyage before you <laughs> eat it, it's, it tastes better. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Okay. So now we're going to kind of add ecology onto the evolution stuff, not kind of move on. Like an onion. Like an onion. Um, okay. So here's a whole bunch of stuff that we're going to, we're going to cover today. Uh, but just to kind of situate you within the conversation, um, we have been talking about muscles of the Great Lake regions in the asynchronous stuff. Uh, we've been talking about sort of big, high-level concepts of evolution in the synchronous stuff. Uh, you're going to be diving into the digital forest, or you already have a little bit, but that's going to be even more now. Um, and uh, we are going to add ecology to the conversation. Um, so we have about four weeks of ecology coming up. Uh, it is kind of centered around forest biodiversity, but of course, 
you know, ecology is not just about forests. Forests present an incredibly, you know, convenient um, opportunity to talk about ecology. Um, and so we've developed the unit around, around plant life instead of invertebrate life. Uh, lots of people wishing us happy Teacher's Day. Oh my goodness. And so goodness. we wish it to you as well. Thank you. And I think about... That's lovely. I think about all sorts of teachers that have had a positive effect on me, including <laughs> my first one. Both of my parents are teachers. Yeah. And that's probably the biggest, most entrenched thing. Yeah. I think about them accessing that all the time. Yeah. Your your dad was a physics teacher? Physics, chemistry, and biology in and high school. Mom? And my mom taught uh, sociology and sexuality at, uh, at college. Yeah. As did. As did mine. So my mother is a professor of sex sexology believe it or not. And my father is a professor of social psychology. And it turns out that our mothers went to school together and we are not cousins. <laughs> <laughs> we, looked, we looked into it. We checked. <laughs> okay. Okay. So we want uh, to try the breakout rooms again to see, uh, to see if it's going to work. Oh my goodness. More, yes, breakout rooms. <laughs> okay, so we've got a Google Doc for you. A um, hundred people can be on it. So once you get into your breakout room, just select um, up to three people um, to to go onto it and actually record the answers to these questions. If you want to screenshot these questions, go ahead. But I will send them to you every couple of minutes um, so that you can kind of focus. If you want to just focus on one. Um, a question, that's fine. I hope though that, um, um, that, uh, we're going to be able to cover it all. If we don't see it being populated, all of them, then I'll throw the question at you to try to get you to, to talk about it a little bit. We'll do this hopefully for about, you know, five or six minutes. We'll see how it goes. If you need us, you can send us an Just invite. Just shout. Just shout. Yeah. <laughs> no, you can send us an invite and we can come in. So okay. are you ready to disapparate? Um, yes, create, uh, well, how many breakout rooms? We're going to go with, I think 30 is the max. Yep. Are you ready? Hold on to your hat. Ready? Go. I'm leaving the room. That's great. Okay. Broadcast message to all. Can you hear what we're saying? The walls are very thick in the breakout room. So those that join, are they going to get? I'm going to added? assign them randomly. Okay. And they'll have to figure a couple out what, more. Uh, yeah. What that are just to joining. Do. That's great. <laughs> are we getting answers? There's people there. I think we're alone. We may not be. I think we're alone. <laughs> You're the same. Oh, no, we're not. Boom, boom, boom. I think we're alone now. Dun, dun, dun. No. It doesn't seem to be happening. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> right? So which one? Is that Tiffany or, or Debbie? Um, I don't know. Neither do I. I thought it would be right in your uh, it, is, it, it is. It is. It is.
Answers? Yep, some answers are popping up. What are we actually measuring? Uh, variety of species, diversity of the biosphere, variability among species. Maybe once we all, um, I think I can filter these to. Okay, question number two is what things? What things might we want to know about a habitat when we are studying diversity? We're already answering it. Latitude, latitude. <laughs> I want to study latitude. I want to study. For some reason, we have stopped the presentation. No. <clears throat> loading, loading. Yes. All good? Wonderful. Look at this. Okay, let's yeah. move on. Question number two, and then question three. For those of you who are just joining, we're in the process of doing a breakout room session. Uh, I feel like throwing you into a breakout room right now would be awkward. So just stick around. Uh, if you go into the chat on uh, D2L on course link, you'll see a link to a Google Doc that we're in the process of filling out to answer the questions that you see on your screen. So why don't you just follow along there on the Google Doc if you want. Um, and we'll call everybody back in a couple of minutes and then go through some of those answers. Some of the people who are just joining, my, I think have been here already and so may just be dealing with internet that's thrown them off uh, so so they're not probably joining from zero okay so welcome so back. welcome back and uh, <laughs> we'll keep checking the door so good luck with your interpipes yeah there's at least one of those names that i've, I've you, seen are you recognize yeah, okay. so i think they're fighting with fair enough internet that is uh I'm glad you were able to come back. Yeah. Okay, we see lots, so shall we call everybody back? Come on! Everybody come on back! <laughs> okay, <laughs> so we've just closed the uh, breakout rooms and uh, it gives everybody like a one minute countdown so everything will get back. Everybody will be back in about 45 seconds from now. I just got thrown off. Did you? Mm -hmm. Oh, goodness. That's sad. And there we go. Welcome back, everyone. Um, Which doesn't mean I can't. <laughs> Okay, so uh, we think the breakout rooms are working fairly well. Um, if uh, if they totally suck, though, let us know. Um, we want you to be able to, for at least a few minutes, talk to each other um, and, uh, and at least have some conversations, which is why we do it. Uh, let us know, though, if it isn't working. Uh, in terms of the output, it is totally working. You've yeah. done really well. Well done. Um, so very well done. We hope that um, uh, that the exercise is helpful and that you'll go back and take a look at all of these things. Um, you know, what do we mean by biodiversity? Um, I love uh, the answer put into uh, uh, row number five. Uh, number of? 
species within an ecosystem. Super good. That kind of captures it beautifully. <laughs> well done. Um, that's good. Diversity of species within a given ecosystem, diversity of the biosphere, layered concepts, genetic evolution. Yeah, I love that idea of that, of how it's layered. Number of species in an area, different species, plants and animals, variability among species. That's interesting. Diversity within species, that's interesting too. And so we really need to come up with a common understanding uh, because there are many different levels of organization that are talked about here in these answers, right? Can you see it? We see diversity within a species. Then we see variability or diversity among species. Um, and then we have diversity of species and all of these things. So it's, it's all very, again, language isn't tricky, but it's precise. So we have to be uh, sort of understanding about what we're talking about. For the purposes of this course, Smith, shall we come up with, on row two, a definition? Sure. So super simple, can we say number of different species? Let's say the number of species in, an, in a place, in an area. In a place. Awesome. Place is not precise, <laughs> but it's great. Good, because then you define place, right? Okay, so we have it up here in number two, number of species in a place. So number of different species. And different then means like, we should actually put that in brackets because really what's a species? Um, we can say taxa. <laughs> taxa, ooh. Um, yeah, so let's just go with this when we're talking about biodiversity. When we're talking about genetic variation, that's basically biodiversity at a different scale of organization right? At a molecular scale, at a cellular scale, right? It's the same kind of concept in that there's variation, um, but it's at a very much finer scale, right? We use different words to be precise, okay? What things might we want to know about a habitat? All the things! <laughs> and there are some things that we don't need to know, um, but we might want to know a lot of things. So, for example, you've talked about abiotic factors, how many species are in a habitat for sure, right? If you're thinking about one species in particular, how many are around it actually matters, right? And we're gonna talk a lot about how to actually measure that um, in meaningful ways. Bodies of water, development, human development, human interactions, barriers, climate what, conditions. What came before, oh, so the history. Oh, nice. And what came before, of course, scales. Yes, so. richness of species, edge habitat, climate and geographic conditions, yes, to all of those things, both abiotic and biotic, you have correctly identified. What concepts from evolution are important in understanding biodiversity? Genetic variation, natural selection, how evolution happens, yes! I love the exclamation mark. Why, how, when? Selective pressures facing the organisms, right? So yes, though that's the ecology, right? how species adapt to environments, the variety of unique species living in the same area, mutations, genetic drift. Yes, yeah, so basically I hope that this has allowed you to realize that all of the things that we've been talking about contribute to, um, uh, to ecology, contribute to biodiversity. Anything else that you want to add? Yep, you can't study one without the other. There you go. Super important. And that we kind of indiscriminately separate them up into different courses is quite artificial. So I hope that you recognize that. It, yeah, it's artificial, but of course the way you're experiencing it is our attempt to deal with our art artificiality is by putting them back together again and not separating evolution from ecology, ecology from physiology, but let's try and talk about them all together because it's kind of one is fuel for the other. Yeah. So Number of species was something that you really wanted to uh, know. This is this is a crazy thing, and some of you probably, if you're joining your family, um, if you're with your family right now, or if you're joining them via Zoom over the holidays, they'll say you're taking a course called biodiversity or biological diversity, and say, "Oh, so how many species are there?" And it's not an easy question to answer, and scientists have been working on this for say ever. There are, and there is a number, 
there is 1.9 million named eukaryotic species. So just the multicellular organisms, and they're distributed amongst the phyla, the the tree of life, like this. So most, if this was a tortier instead of a, a square cake, let's call it of the meat of life, it would taste very insecty. Um, it would taste a lot. There'd be a lot of kind of plants in there, but very little uh, vertebrates. Little crunchy bits in your teeth. Yeah, so lots of chitin. <laughs> now, how many species are there? That's a different question. So 1.9, fewer than 2 million names. The total diversity might be, we might have done 2% or 20%. There may be more than 100 million species waiting out there to be named. So two, more than 250 years after Linnaeus developed the, kingdom, the, the kind of species epithet that we use, genus and species, this traditional way of naming things, we're either 20% done or we're 2% done. So there's lots of this. And this is an invocation to you, and you probably know this intuitively. It's, there's lots of good reasons to be a biodiversity scientist or someone who's literate in biodiversity. One of them is because there's a lot of work to do, and as the other is, of course, uh, that we're changing the game for a lot of these species. And so we, we need to know them before our activities uh, make them go extinct. And so the direct connection uh, of evolution and ecology can be looked at in this way. Evolution basically deals with the evolution of new species or the changes in species, right? It also talks a lot about extinction, right? Um, and so it's kind of, if you want a kind of analogy, it's kind of the drip, the faucet drip of adding new species to a pool that then overflows at some point. And the pool, the bowl, or the sink uh, is ecology. It's the context in which things change um, and relationships happen, okay? And of course, if we go back to our trees, we remember that if we're looking at a phylogeny that has species at the tips, then those nodes represent speciation events that happen when there are barriers to gene flow. Now, this is the connection to ecology because it's ecology that introduces those barriers to gene flow for the most part. And how's it, how does it do that? Physiology. Right. We'll get there. <laughs> we'll get there. But there are here are two concepts. Again, we're just going to introduce these two for the purposes of this course, and, and they'll be diving into them uh, in your second year courses. Um, but there are uh, two barriers, two types of barriers to gene flow. One of them is a geographical barrier, and the other is a situational barrier. Okay. So a geographical barrier is, is kind of the, the most easily to, to, easy to grasp, where basically a population gets physically subdivided, uh, where there is no gene flow across, so there's a barrier to gene flow. Um, that basically means that the mutations that are happening in this population are obviously different than the ones happening here. The selection pressures are different, and so over time these two um, basically create a node, a speciation event, um, and they go off in their own separate species directions. The situational one, you want to... The sympatric one? Yeah. Sim, meaning in the same place. So there's some other way that things are broken apart. So there's reproductive isolation, even though to us, and this is an important thing, it seems like they're in the same place. The history of studying speciation, this uh, particular mechanism has lagged behind because of biases that we have where we can see a mountain. We're like, well, the mountain probably interferes with the tiny little beetle or the river, the fast flowing river interferes with the little mouse that couldn't possibly swim across it or the mountain range or yada, yada, yada. Did it yada yada yada? yada, yada. Nice. Yeah. So <laughs> it has like like Jewish translation. Right, right, Seinfeld, <laughs> Seinfeld version. So sympatric speciation essentially invokes or encourages you as a biologist to think about the separation that could occur from the perspective of the organism, which is the perspective you ought to be taking as someone who studies biological diversity. So in this case, um, a fly that reproduces on a, um, a particular species of, um, of apple tree, for instance, or banana in this example, that reproduces at one time of the year is reproductively isolated from the, the fly that reproduces on the tree, potentially the same tree, but the flowers occur three months later in the year. 
So temporal isolation, isolation because you eat different food sources, isolation, uh, temporal is a big one, but it's, it, it encourages you us to look at things from the perspective um, of the organism. There you go. Thank you. And so we would like to think about something. Um, we're going to get you to do a menti in just a second. So if you want to open it up to www.menti.com, we'll throw up the, the instructions in a second, but if you want to just be ready, um, we in ecology can ask then, you know, in the context of that sink of that pool, why are species found where they are? So this is not talking about sort of interactions, but why are they there, right? What's their story? How did they get there? Um, and also we can ask, why aren't they where they're not? And that is a super fun question that can be a little bit confusing. Yeah. So we take a look at this beautiful maple. This it's, is, if you're in southwestern Ontario, this is in, in the Niagara region. And it's thought to be one of the oldest hardwoods, one of the oldest sugar maples in this part of the world. So approximately 500 years ago, this was a tree that germinated uh, before there was any kind of European interference in in this part of the world. And it's, think of the changes that it has lived through. Yep, big change. Ice storms, right? Many. Many. Yeah. All sorts of things, right? So why is it there? How did it get there? That individual, but also that species. What What's the story, the natural history of the actual species? Why is it there? Why is it not somewhere else, right? And that tells you a lot about the biology of the species itself. So how did it get here? Why isn't it a different species? Why isn't it a different species? And why are species not where they aren't? <laughs> so here's tree line. Here's, you know, it's a concept that exists on, on all of the mountains at some point when, you know, mountains that have trees to begin with, at some point they don't have trees um, if you get high enough, right? And sometimes mountains aren't high enough. Uh, but those that are have this line, this fixed line. So what's going on across that line that can literally be just, you know, a few meters from one condition to the other? What's different? Why are they not there? And so what we'd like you to do is to get on to Menti um, and see what you come up with. So why are species found where they are and aren't where they are not? Feel free to type in whatever you want. I believe that you can do multiple times, so it's not just one answer. Um, see if you can come up with something. Go and I'll share what's going on in the chat here on Menti. I love this one, Chance. Yes, I'm just <laughs> writing about that in the in the chat. Very room. good. Lack of food, plantation. So yeah, we we move things where they probably ought not to be. And then of course move things intentionally and unintentionally. Uh, yeah, different conditions, environment. scrolling for me. Nope. There we go. Evolution. Good. The weather. Yes, and eh, you might want to broaden up that scale on the weather answer. It's more about the climate, and I see the climate there as well. Good. Okay. So what are some of the things here? It's starting to scroll again, so thank you very much. Inhabitable conditions, yes. Soil conditions, variation in physical traits, super good. Climate's a big deal. Yep, yep. Human activity, thank you. Both in terms of bringing species where they weren't before, yeah. and also, of course, in removing species that were there uh, originally. Species live in suitable environment, access to resources, 
environmental conditions. Tolerance ranges, nice, thank you. We're gonna be talking about that one for sure. Air pressure becomes too low. Good, okay, so now you're thinking about tree line going up the mountain. It's possible that the pressure plays a role. Habitat that they can or cannot survive in. Very, very good. Okay, this is good. So there could be many reasons. A tree could be planted somewhere by someone and for animals, they choose to live in places with a good environment for their survival. Very good. Okay, excellent. Lots of good, lots of good ideas. And I see lots of connections yep. to abiotic things for sure. Yep, lots of good things. Wonderful, but also some biotic things, which yeah. is also really important. And I love the one that said by chance, because sometimes that's the story, yeah. right? It's kind of one principal element that I don't see yet. What's that? I don't want to say unless we're going to keep going. Ah, uh, we're really running out of time. That's what I don't see. Time. Yeah. Time. Time is an important thing. Okay. Cool. Thank you so much. Very well done. Okay. Here's a whole whack of jargon for those students who are just like, tell us a definition. Yeah. So here yep. you go. Lovely. <laughs> this is for you. <laughs> so these are just some phrases that are attached to the things that you've been, that we've been watching you scroll through on Menti that, that kind of categorize some of those things. So if we talked about a, a species that evolved in one place and it's only found there, that's an, in, we're going to call that an endemic species. And if it's evolved somewhere else and then is moved, we can talk about the range of a species and how it's expanded or contracted or shifted in general, which would encompass both. Um, how do they do that? Well, they do it by dispersal. And so the, num the point number four th gets you thinking about the, the movement capacity of the species, both its endogenous with the, that which it can do on its own. Um, or that which is moved by other things, so the introduced or and or invasive. And then the, the word vicariance, which you probably run into before, it just involves, uh, it's a word to describe the splitting that we described earlier, a vicariant event, one that splits something that was previously united into two things. So that mountain, that river, that highway. That continent. That continent. Hey! Whose continent is this? <laughs> Idea! Move your crap! Well, yeah, it's moved a millimeter this year. But yeah, so vicariance is the one that students kind of get hung up on most because it is kind of way more of an abstract concept, the whole idea that like something splits apart. Um, but yeah, think about continental drift and, and, and that pretty much uh, describes vicariance where, you know, it isn't the species that are shifting in range, it's the stuff underneath them uh, that is shifting in range. And just as a word, we talked about the comfort maple, so that's 500 years old. We did say it was an old tree, but just specifically thinking about plate tectonics, continental drift and how that occurs over such a long time period. There are trees in Ontario that are old enough that there were still super active volcanoes in uh, BC when those trees in Ontario were growing. So these are, we have some very, very old things, things that were the trees in Ontario that germinated at like 700 AD, the year 700, which is kind of bananas. <laughs> That's bananas. You, you think about, <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's, a, it's a cedar tree, but it's not a banana tree. But, um, so when you think about plate tectonics and continental drift, you're you're thinking about a longer time scan, time scale, but for many species, particularly trees, that might be a time scale that they are going to experience. Okay, so and they are on the escapement. Yes. Question for you to work on for homework for studying for the evolution midterm uh, that's coming up not anytime right away, <laughs> but come back to this. How would you test these? If we described a scenario, uh, an observation of a distribution of a species, how would you go about testing which one is possible or which combination, which two are possible? What tests could you do and design in order to be able to start like honing in on figuring out which one of these five possibilities it is? So just throwing it out there as a massive Easter egg for the mint. Okay. <laughs> We're going to go through this quickly because this is just an introduction to what you're going to be doing asynchronously, uh, which, which you've already started doing. So we'll just kind of incorporate it here so that you can come back and, and look at the recording of this um, uh, if you have any questions or anything. But it's just kind of an introduction to, to, to what 
uh, we've developed for you on the asynchronous stuff. We want to ask you first, though, if you wouldn't mind using your stamp tool to stamp which one of these, and, and I'm sorry, I forgot to include the continuation of the numbers. They're all supposed to be numbered. It's not a trick. Which one or ones of these uh, are forests? You guys are quick on the draws. Stamp, 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 stamp. Good. Amazing. Okay, so what I'm getting from all of you is that all of these are forests. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to clear all of this and I'm going to change it up with the question. <laughs> I love the doodles. Well done. Okay, so we're going to clear it. I'll ask you to stop stamping for just one second. Um, and my question to you is... We're trying. You're trying to clear. We're <laughs> I mean, trying to clear. My question to you is stop, please. <laughs> um, it's, really not. it's really not stopping? Okay. I think that's an internet thing, actually, because I'm not getting the ability to stop it either. If you could all clear your own. <laughs> um, here we go. I think the internet is coming back. La, la, la. Very slowly. <laughs> Which makes me wonder what we sound like. I'm yeah, clear. Yeah, there's a slow internet connection that's happening right now for us. Okay, I'm going to clear all the drawings, if I can. And I'm going to ask you this question. If you had to pick one that is not a forest, which one would you pick? Haha. <laughs> So from what I'm getting from this, if it isn't a difference in the internet connection, <laughs> that all of you at least have picked one of these. Um, and that's really interesting to me. Uh, is there any one there that you would pick that would not be a forest? I think uh, if you want to, I, I can play United Nations advocate and say all the different agencies within the UN, when they define a forest, they explicitly say land. So I could play their advocate and say the kelp forest ah. uh, isn't Boo. a forest, and I disagree, but I can, I can play that role. Okay, so... If, That's not a forest, it's not on the land. Okay, so I would definitely say the kelp forest is a forest, and I might say that number eight, um, the plantation, I might be able to come up with an argument for why that is not a forest. Yep. Yeah? Do sure. you see it? I, I, okay. I, yep. Okay. Oh, and but then... But interesting. Oh, we're going to have to... Oh, look. Oh, okay. Our internet... Just is caught up. caught catching up, and it seems like there are some people who are saying yes. The plantation is not a forest. The kelp is not a forest. The kelp, and the Arctic. And the Arctic is not a forest. And Whoa. I want to talk about that. The Arctic, because the Arctic is in fact a teeny tiny forest. All of that that you see um, is a willow. It's a willow forest, um, and. and Potentially many species of willow. Many species of willow with many other species uh, underneath, around it, grasses, plants, all sorts of things that are happening. Because a forest isn't defined by its height, right? A forest is defined by its other characteristics, and those are ill-defined. But, okay, cool, this was good. And sorry for the slow internet. Um, I'm going to ask you to please stop annotating. Um, and then it's going to take three or four minutes for, for it to stop on our end. <laughs> uh, but I'm going to clear all of the drawings and see if that works. Yeah, that's really interesting. Okay, so we just had a, a bit of a, an internet speed uh, difference, which I find fascinating. Are you hearing us well? Or are we lagging? Let us know in Let the chat. Let us know in the chat. Okay. Okay. So, moving on. We are going to be talking about... Thank the, you. The, we're okay? We're good. We're good. Okay. We're going to be talking about um, the dairy bush. And, and, from, from this, <laughs> um, and we've created the digital forest around the dairy bush. And so we're going to be so intimately connected to this dairy bush digital forest uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, <laughs> we just Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> um, here it is. Um, here's campus. Right, right over here. 
Um, some of you um, may live really close. We live, where do we live? We live like up in this direction, maybe a little bit further. Um, and so it is a place that is pretty close to us. And of course, uh, with the Dr. Smith's research, um, it's a, a pretty important place for, for all of us and the stuff that I'm developing through the digital forest um, technology. Uh, it's uh, yeah near and dear to our hearts. So there's a question that always comes up. Why is it called the dairy bush? Oh, and totally. quickly, uh, there isn't a reason. It's not officially called. It is actually officially called the dairy bush in the university's documents. It doesn't refer to a naming. However, uh, agricultural, this has been an agricultural college for a long time. The dairy barn has existed for a long, long, long time. And it's common agricultural practice to maintain a woodlot on your farm, particularly to give your cattle, for instance, a cooler place to go in the summertime. I love the so, way that you said farm, because that's super Ottawa Valley. <laughs> your farm. Your farm. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, you got to give your cattle a place to go in the summertime when it just gets hot. <laughs> so from the Ottawa Valley. <laughs> yeah. Shout out to everyone who's from the Ottawa Valley. Um, and... Uh, especially if you're trying to access this from the internet within the Ottawa Valley, good luck to you. Yeah. Um, so that's probably why it's a legacy of that is that the, the cattle that were in there. And so some of the trees that are there have been planted. The Zabbitts Hall that you'll run into, Zabbitts was the first forester in Ontario. He planted all of those white pines that are there. But some of the trees that are on the Edinburgh side, um, those seeded naturally and are older than the city of Guelph. They predate John Galt forming the city of Guelph. So you have first growth forest within nice. your natural areas. Amazing. If you are in the Guelph area and you need a break, going for a walk in the dairy bush yeah. can be fabulous. Um, so the uh, asynchronous activities and lessons that we have for you on Course Link talk about the dairy bush, but they also talk about some other um, uh, some other woodlots that we have uh, the incredible privilege and luck to have on campus. Um, so here we've just outlined them in dark green um, to show you their arboretum is, is huge. It's the biggest of them. We have the North, North Campus Ravine, we have Browns Woods, and we have um, the Dairy Bush. And so here we've kind of just focused in on them specifically. You can see their relative size. They are all different. And, oh! We have kind of digitized them and simplified them for you um, by creating a, a scenario uh, online where we've kind of put together the biodiversity of the different tree species that are easier to kind of focus on and to study as we walk you through all of the different lessons. So we've developed this kind of icon type um, approach to being able to work with the species. That and are these there. icons are the are the icons of those particular species. If trees really turn your crank, um, these are the icons from the Canadian Forest Service to represent each one of these species. Yay. And we had them on tables at our wedding. We did. Yeah. That's right. Um, okay, so Browns Woods looks like this, right? We've simplified Browns Woods for you. It doesn't it is actually about, that's look about like... life size, though. <laughs> um, and then. Uh, uh, North Campus Ravine looks like this, just trying to get you used to looking at these types of <clears throat> images and interpreting them. Um, based on what you've read so far, for those of you who were able to do it though, um, basically think about the information that we've given you about these three, um, what you've read so far, and imagine that you had to decide which one of these was going to be bulldozed for a condo development. Okay, And this is of course not a <laughs> out of left field scenario. This is something that the university has done and does all the time with lands that it owns is that it, it considers them uh, a resource that it can harvest when, yeah. it, when it needs to make money. <laughs> uh, good job, Samantha. None. Totally agree. But imagine that you had to. Okay, Your life depended on it. You had oh. to pick. Uh, which one would you give up thinking about what you already know? Somebody's suggesting in the chat, because of the geometry of the dairy bush, they would cut that. The geometry is interesting. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay, super good. So, whole bunch of disagreement, though North Campus Ravine seems to be getting thrown under the bus a lot faster than the other ones. Good. That's great. So, everyone, there's an argument for each of them, right? And we, what we want to focus on is the arguments. 
okay? Because that's really uh, an ecology type question. We can use ecological tools in order to be able to understand what the arguments can be, okay? And the tools that you select to parameterize your argument might lead you to different conclusions. Right. Super, super good. Okay, I'm having difficulty again clearing the annotations. I'm on board with, I simply would not. I hear ya. <laughs> um, if you're able to clear your annotations so that we can see it on the next slide, that would help me a lot. Oh, good, it happened, great. <laughs> More importantly though, what information do you still want? So using your text tool on your annotation and kind of let's try to spread it out and I'll read them off as quickly as I see them coming. What do you still want to know? What, what questions or what variables do you still want to measure that we haven't yet presented to you uh, about these different woodlots? And if it doesn't fill in, if you Number see of cover, species, covered up, put it in the chat as well. Biodiversity, location, uh, variation, the age, the, yeah, the endemic nature of the species that are there. Browns has too much history, biodiversity, the soil, the ratio of invasive species, that's really interesting. Whether there are rare species, overall species richness, which ones are used more for research, Smith's gonna like that one. Abundance of each species, also really important, why some species do better, uh, very good. Okay, so tons and tons of questions still, and that makes me very happy because we're going to be talking a lot about that. Just don't clear that here. Okay, you're going to capture it. We are going to save it. Good, we've saved it. Wonderful. And now I'm going to clear it. So we're going to clear. Oh, we're going to try. Oh, we're going to try. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My internet's coming back. Okay, cool. And so that basically is our segue into everything that's going to come uh, for the rest of the ecology unit. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we're very grateful for all of your enthusiasm and participation. Jump on that um, joint uh, asynchron asynchronous study session that we've got going for you. I'm pretty excited about it, actually. We've kind of, we, we really hope that you enjoy it and that you take advantage of it and that you really try to write contributions that, that are going to cause other students to, to really think about it. So try to use as many of the terms and the vocabulary that we've thrown at you. Try to write something where half of the students are going to think it's true, half are going to think it's false. Then you know you've written a good one. Um, and then we'll, um, we'll weigh in, we'll make sure that the conversation is going in a good direction. Where and how? These are the questions in the chat right now. Where do we join? How? Oh, where is it? How do we To join? join the asynchronous study session, all you have to do is go to the discussion board in CourseLink, go to Topic Evolution, and it's a thread uh, where we've put in the photo that is going to be the sort of you know topic of conversation, and we've put in the Google Doc link uh, to then go and participate. We have all the instructions there, um, and if you have any questions, please do feel free to get in touch. So thank you. We're going to shut down for just a minute. And if you're interested in sticking around, we're going to stick around. And uh, yeah. yeah, we'll talk soon. Have a great week. We'll see you Wednesday. Bye.